performance psychology for me is, is three things specifically. The first thing is, is understanding the mental factors of performance to raise performance and to get performance more consistent. So if you're performing out of four out of 10, you want to get that up to an eight or a nine or a 10 out of 10. And then you don't want it to keep going 10, three, nine, five, eight, eight, three. You don't want that. You want it to be consistent, seven, eight, nine, 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 nine. That's what everybody wants, right? They want stability. So getting the performance up and keeping it consistent. That's number one. The second thing is on the mental health and well-being. Now, this is not a soft approach. This is not of a they're there crying my shoulder approach. This is more a case of your fitness has a physical component and a mental component. Your physical fitness is how well your muscles work, how long you can last. Your mental fitness is how well does your mind work and how long can it last. And when we're talking in specifically mental health and well-being, we're talking about managing stress, managing anxiety, and managing depression. These are all at the subclinical level. Assalamu alaikum all and welcome to another episode of the Optimized Muslim Podcast. Alhamdulillah, today very happy to be joined by Muhammad Saqib all the way from Malaysia, mashallah, and he's a performance psychologist, so someone who's very much aligned with, I think a lot of the audience will resonate with the message and the topic. So yeah, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. How are you today, Adil? <laughs> Alhamdulillah, all good. Jazakallah khair for joining. Yes, yes. Thanks for having me. Thanks for inviting me. I'm honored to be here. No, don't say that. <laughs> we had a pre-interview chat and I told you at the time that I'm just excited to just get straight into the conversation and come out from like a, a bit of a blank slate and just kind of answer, ask you the question, depending on my curiosity and also what I think will be beneficial as well, inshallah. So. Sure. You have quite an interesting kind of confluence of skills, I guess. It's not very often that I come across Muslim performance psychologists. I haven't really looked that hard, to be honest. I'm sure there's loads of them, but, but I just wanted to, I find it interesting. And obviously brother Martin, who we both know, he recommended that I invite you on as a guest as well. So for that reason, I was very interested by looking at your page on Instagram and we can link that in the description afterwards. So first, just tell me a bit about yourself and yeah, how you got into this line of work. I'll let you take it however you want in terms of how general you <laughs> want to be your. All right. Wonderful. So time for me to, to wing it. <laughs> so firstly, yeah, appreciate that brother Mante that has hooked us up. He's a very fascinating, interesting brother as well and a very kind soul. So yeah, th there are a few of us knocking around Muslim performance psychologists. <laughs> They're not, not that easy to find, but they do exist. They do exist. Yeah. So I'll, myself, first thing first, I was born into a Muslim family from, from the UK, from a small town in Somerset, I grew up in Leicester, uh, in the middle of England, alhamdulillah. And I did all kinds of jobs and studies and all sorts. I was into banking. I was into a little bit of teaching here and there. I, I used to play a lot of badminton as well. And when I started playing badminton at a competitive level, cause I got pretty decent pretty quickly, I started to realize just how important the mental side of playing badminton was. It wasn't just about the technical skills or my own poor training. It was about my mind going into those situations and my mind in the situation itself. And that was pretty much what sparked the curiosity. And I decided to study sports psychology. I had a few contacts from around the world and I decided to look for some training elsewhere. And that was how I ended up in Malaysia in the first place. So I actually came here to train in badminton because the guys here are top, top in that sport. If you see now in the Commonwealth games, they're doing pretty all right. They just won the gold medal there for the team championships. So that was it. And that's how I came to Malaysia. And then I did a bachelor's in sports psychology, a master's in sport and exercise psychology, and partway through a PhD. And I basically settled here and I got work here. So that's pretty much how I kind of grew up, got into the field, got into my sports career. Made Hydra to Malaysia as well. And yeah, I love, I love sport and performance psychology because I feel it's, it's a topic that everybody's kind of astonished by, you know, what makes champions so superior to others in, in their fields, not, not as people generally, but in their fields. And it's always between basically what's between the ears. It always comes down to that. So people are very, 
amazed to kind of learn about that. What's the secrets? What's the tips? What's the strategy? So it's a very fascinating topic of study, Alhamdulillah. And yeah, it's been, it's been a fruitful career so far, Alhamdulillah. Okay. Very interesting and very kind of interesting synopsis that you just gave. There's a lot of stuff that I wanted to ask you about. So <laughs> I was looking through your Instagram and yeah, I saw you uh, some clips with about badminton and stuff. So I, I didn't know how much you were into it, but that's interesting to learn. So that you were playing at quite a high level and that was kind of your intro into sports psychology in a sense, because obviously it applied to yourself. But then also, would you say that's how you found people and contacts that allowed you to kind of study as well or get into the field? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, would, I wouldn't say the highest level. I never played for, for England. I started very late as well. And, you know, those guys, they were, they were hardcore. You know, they, were, they were training two or three hours every day. I did take a couple of them down in kind of regional matches, uh, little tournaments, but they weren't, they weren't the top players, you know, and I would say that was my level. You know, and I was training frequently with kind of the international standard, but I wasn't international standard by any means, I'm not even the best player within my county by any means, you know, but I was really, really into it. You know, it was, you know, I used to follow all of the tournaments. It used to be kind of the highlight of my week, you know, is to train and yeah, it does open up everything. You know, I think when people find their passions and they get really stuck into something, I think it's very easy to come across people who are also into that as well. And you do have a unique kind of bond and. Yeah, it's wonderful to make teammates and stuff like that. I remember from my uni days, the guys I'm still in touch with were all my, in my badminton team. And to this day, like a good 10 years after, and you know, we're like blood brothers, they're bonded for life. So, you know, we were part of the badminton team. So it's a, it's a good kind of uh, fraternity to get into, whether it's a local club and you do learn a lot about social skills and you do learn a lot about character building in sport itself. So things like good decorum and good manners and handling defeat, handling success. You learn a lot of that through sport, discipline, how to stay motivated, what to do when you're not motivated. You do learn a lot of that through sport. So yeah, I made a lot of contacts, Alhamdulillah. And from studies, studies was a bit of a separate angle, but the interest from it started within badminton. It was a case of, oh, what is this? What is the reason why sometimes I can win and sometimes I can lose? Oh, it's my mindset. All right. This, oh, that's an actual field. That's an actual job. Oh, I didn't realize that. So the introduction came through badminton, yeah, for sure. Okay, great. And did you study your bachelor's in the UK? Bachelor's and yeah. master's? Yeah, yeah. Bachelor's and master's in the, in the UK. That's right. PhD is still going on from the UK, but it's, it's distance learning. So for anyone who wants to come study, you know, you can go into the British Psychological Society's website, have a look at their accredited degrees, either in psychology or sports psychology or applying sports psychology. Make sure they're British Psychological Society accredited because if they're not, probably not worth doing. And you can do the same for masters as well. So you can <laughs> just to put it out there because it's the official badge. And then for masters, same thing as well. Have a look at which courses are around and you know, you could probably get onto a decent one. Yeah. But they're getting more and more expensive. I think these days. <laughs> yeah. Mashallah, it's interesting that you mentioned that. And the, the reason I was smiling is because I actually enrolled a couple of years ago for a master's slash conversion in psychology, right? And sure. I was accepted in Leicester, your home city, I think, right? And yeah, well. it's, it's, it's like a good university and whatnot. And I was excited about it. I was kind of 50, 50 in terms of whether or not I would go ahead because I had loads of other stuff going on at the same time as well. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. then I got a, an email that kind of sealed the deal for me, which was, oh, we've lost our accreditation with the British psychological society, right? And uh, I was like, I've got no interest in, and then the, obviously in the email, they were like, don't worry, we're applying back and we're going to try and obviously regain our position. They never did because it's been like a couple of years. So each year I've just been deferring it another year kind of thing. And so, yeah, it's funny that you mentioned that. Okay. So how would you, if someone was to ask you, it seems quite self-explanatory, but obviously it's interesting to actually get the answer from a professional. If someone was to ask you, what is performance psychology? What would be your answer? Okay. So yeah, well, um, just on, just on Leicester, they, they need to get their stuff together because the British Psychological Society's head office is in Leicester. <laughs> it's, the first, it's the first university. I think it's just, uh, just off New Walk, which is a main little strip in Leicester Town. And the University of Leicester crosses that. So they, they, they got to get that together. In terms yeah, of, exactly. Yeah, they, that's, not, that's not good. 
in terms of performance psychology, to answer your question directly, every kind of performance psychometric trainer has a different opinion about this, which is not good. You know, there's been a lot of debate on the field. There's mental gurus, mental coaches, mind trainers, and nobody can really agree. But for myself, who's thought a lot about this question, performance psychology for me is, is three things specifically. The first thing is, is understanding the mental factors of performance to raise performance and to get performance more consistent. So if you're performing out of four out of 10, you want to get that up to an eight or a nine or a 10 out of 10. And then you don't want it to keep going 10, three, nine, five, eight, eight, three. You don't want that. You want it to be consistent, seven, eight, nine, 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 nine. That's what everybody wants, right? They want stability. So getting the performance up and keeping it consistent. That's number one. The second thing is on the mental health and well-being. Now, this is not a soft approach. This is not a there, there, crying my shoulder approach. This is more a case of your fitness has a physical component and a mental component. Your physical fitness is how well your muscles work, how long you can last. Your mental fitness is how well does your mind work and how long can it last. And when we're talking in specifically mental health and well-being, we're talking about managing stress, managing anxiety, and managing depression. These are all at the subclinical level. If it goes past that, then it's already outside of the whole psychology realm. It needs to go to a clinical psychologist, which I will talk about a little bit later on. Okay. So number one is getting performance up, keeping it consistent. Number two, mental health and well-being. The third one is about personality development, personal growth and development of a person. So whether you're talking about an individual athlete, you want to grow them into a leader, someone who's a great communicator, someone who's confident, someone who is great at explaining roles, someone who's able to take charge, bring people together. This is a person who's gone beyond just being the athlete performer, but they're growing as an individual. So that's the third area. So performance psychology, anyone who's in my role should be supporting athletes or coaches or corporate leaders or whoever with these three elements. Mm, okay. Very nicely explained and very interesting for me. So there's, okay. Increasing like your performance level and then maintaining it in terms of consistency yeah. and then also personality development and mental health and well-being. Mm. Okay. So it's not, you're not just limiting, limited to working with sports people or athletes. It's kind of. Yeah. Yeah. A range of people, or do you work particularly just with sports people? Yeah. I, it, this is a great question as well, because sport and performance psychology, the, the field in the UK is known as sports psychology. Basically they primarily work only with athletes. But what we find is, is that the same principles apply in many different settings. So if you're a student about to take an exam. That's pretty similar to a top athlete about to go to the Commonwealth Games of the Olympics, because you're there, you're there, there's a, there's a preparation element, there's revision, there's study, there's training, there's periodization, and there's a big event, which is highly stressful, has a lot of pressure on it. And then there's a result in an outcome and then there's all the emotions and everything in between. So the, a student taking an exam is a lot like an athlete going to a major event. And it's the same with the corporate setting too. I actually call the people that I work with in the corporate field, they're, they're corporate athletes because they have a sim similar kind of things. There's, there's a high performance component, there's a teamwork element, there's meeting demands element. There's a, I've got to get up and get ready to go every day element, which is very similar to what athletes go through. And the way my time is split, I split that kind of between athletes and in the corporate setting. I don't really work much with students, but you know, it would, it would be an easy transition. It's the same things apply in many different contexts. Yeah. Yeah. And it's also the fact that obviously the core kind of neurology is the same in terms of similar kind of issues that people face irrespective of which field they're in, right. like you mentioned, because essentially anxiety is the same in terms of it, it comes from the same neurochemicals, doesn't it? Right. Essentially, which everyone has just that it's, it comes into place because of different uh, stimuli, essentially. Yep. Okay. Bec how would you differentiate what you do and normal coaching or say life coaching? Okay. Life, life coaching is interesting because generally speaking, what I know of life coaches is an unaccredited field, basically. There's no international body that's recognized by multiple industries. They're hard to protect them with insurance as well, if I'm not mistaken. But I might be wrong on that. I, I definitely might be wrong on that. It's been a long time since I've looked into it. But life coaching generally are people who give a lot of advice. Yeah. So if I'm in a situation, how can you help me how to grow? Psychologists can and do give advice as well, but the kind of the formulaic system of it is totally different. 
psychologists for the most part, when in the beginning of their training, they're taught to do a lot of that. Then they're untrained doing that. So they're taught to kind of take a back seat, be more effective, let the client take the driving, take the steering wheel, follow their flow. But a life coach might be ready to jump in and give you advice and say, do this, do this, do this, do this, do this. Also as well, from a, I'm, I'm not a clinical psychologist. I, I'm into sport and performance psychology. And I, I've not got my phone accreditation yet, but Alhamdulillah, the application looks like it's been successful. Inshallah, I'll be coming soon. Clinical psychologists work with severe issues that sports and performance psychologists don't. So if I'm working with someone who's mildly stressed, that's different from a clinical psychologist who work with someone who's chronically stressed. And I don't believe that a life coach has the ability, the training or the qualifications to support someone who's clinically stressed. And this is really, really important because if someone's mental fitness is on the edge and their mental health is on the edge, they might feel comfortable with a life coach, but what's the life coach going to do? That's empirically sound. That's ethically sound. We don't know because they're not empirically trained and they're not ethically trained. <laughs> so, you know, it's, it's kind of it, it, the, 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 the way that I would see it is, is okay. Your, your nutritionist will know a lot about health. Your strength and conditioning coach will know a lot about health, but you, when you're ill, you go to the doctor. You don't go to people who know a lot about health. You go to the right person for the right job. So life coaches, they tend to be in a little bit of different fields. I guess the similarity between life coaches and psychologists are that there's a talking element, there's a face-to-face -face element, and there seems to be a, a drive towards certain goals. Those would be the main things that they would share, but everything else would be different. Yeah. Because I think especially in the internet age and social media and marketing and whatnot, mm. It's very difficult. I guess this has always existed in some form, even before the internet age, because yeah. obviously you had some gurus like Tony Robbins and uh, other personalities cool. who I don't think are actually trained in terms of, I'm not sure actually, but let's assume for the purposes of the point that they're not trained in terms of psychology or yeah. anything else, but that's essentially the service that they provide. Like someone like Tony Robbins, especially he focuses on like creating transformations in people, right? So it'd be like yeah. helping people to achieve their goals and whatnot. And what I find is because there's a crossover in terms of the problems that all of these different professionals deal with, yeah. essentially they're helping someone get from a state that they're somewhat dissatisfied with to a different state of performance right. or mental health or whatever else, right. because then you've got someone like Jordan Peterson, who's a clinical psychologist who right talks about how he was a practicing clinical psychologist in terms of he had patients and whatnot. Mm. And he might give people life advice, you know, helping people with their careers and stuff, yeah. because it's linked with their mental health. If someone's That's struggling cool. in their career, and that might be a big factor in terms of their overall depression, anxiety. But then a lot of times I feel like people would just connect with someone that they believe can get them results because let's say if there's someone online like even myself i see this when i like certain content creators when someone aligns with like their way of thinking that... you just for some reason even even though it might not be the wisest approach like you said in terms of they might not be academically trained you don't really know whether they're subject to any ethical uh, right. rules and guidelines but people just assume that these people can help them. And if there's that element of trust as well, yep. I feel like unless some, there's like a sports body, say if there's a team and they have staff, they'd probably, and they want to try and get a, a professional to help their athletes, they'd probably go straight to someone who's qualified like a performance or sports psychologist. Mm -hmm. Whereas if it's just like an individual, I feel like that boundary is kind of blurred and they just go for anyone who they think that can help them. Yeah. The Adil, this is a beautiful point. It's, it's a very well articulated and you've come at it from a different, from a couple of different angles there. The, the first thing first is that psychologists need to be a bit more humble because it's all well and good saying, oh, I've got a bachelor's and a master's and a PhD and I've got doctors, doctorate titles coming out of every hole. And then not being able to communicate properly, using language that is so complex that people can't understand what's in your mind anyway, not, be, not being trustworthy, not having a good character. And th this is a major, major problem because someone who might be unqualified and untrained, they might be more trustworthy as an individual than someone who is qualified and trained. Because at the end of the day, that certification is a piece of paper and it's taken a few years and it's, it's taken money. It's not, it's tried and tested as your character. And there, there are no qualifications that really test for that. You know, some of the psychologists that I've met, 
you know, stuff for a lot, some of the most horrible characters you could think of in very high position. And I am just want to say it openly, you know, the, the way they speak to people, how they make people feel, putting them down. It's, it's like, what is this? Who go to you for help? And you, you habitually put people down in the way that you speak. Why would I trust you? You know, but someone who's got a better way of words. And, you know, we see this from, from mashallah, so many people are doing that way as well. You know, I look up to them as well, but like, say like Mufti Mike or whoever. You can watch a few minutes clip and you can come out of that feeling so boosted on motivation. He's not a psychologist, but he's made an impact to your psychology. He's not a psychologist, but he's made an impact to your psychology. And it's a similar thing that you mentioned with Tony Robbins and stuff like that. They're, they're using their life experience. They're using their clear methods of communication. They're using their trustworthiness to inspire people. And that is a psychological thing because as soon as you listen to it, you're feeling different at the end of it, you know? And psychologists, we need to keep that in mind that we don't communicate as a whole. We don't communicate as well as other people in the field. Otherwise, more people will come to us. That's the reality. And also as well, just on another point added, we are, we are very good at human in terms of finding others that we have things in common with, like I said, like a confirmation bias, right? So if, if there is a Chinese athlete and they spoke to a Chinese psychologist, it'd be easier for them to click. If you're a South Indian athlete and you spoke to a South Indian psychologist, it'd be easy for you to click, yeah? Because we are emotional beings and we like to find comfort in other people that we speak to, right? So there's an element of there that actually as individuals, what we bring to the table, our results, our lived experience, our ways of speaking, our knowledge of culture is also important because you could make someone feel totally uncomfortable by being on a different wavelength and your qualifications don't mean anything at that point. <laughs> Sorry to say. Hmm. Mashallah, yeah. Very good point. And it's like very balanced, especially coming from like a psychologist. You would think a psychologist would have like a particular view, potentially favoring psychologists. No. Not necessarily like a, <laughs> a bias in a negative sense, but just because you might have different insights having worked like that. Because oftentimes people who are within a field, they develop a a better understanding of some of the counterpoints that people might mention and stuff like that. But the point about communication, I was thinking about this recently that I feel like, especially with the internet and online and YouTube and video formats becoming the dominant format. And I was reading something recently about how even Facebook and Instagram, to some extent, the reason why they're pushing reels and they're the kind of medium that's currently getting a lot of traction. Right. One, they're trying to copy and get some of the uh, success from TikTok, right? But on another point, I feel like eventually the top communicators rise in terms of all of the different fields. And this used to be a bit of a debatable point in da'wah. People still make it and it's true in that don't go for just charismatic speakers because essentially that's not necessarily directly proportionate at all to actual knowledge or ilm of the deen Refer. or even piety, right? Refer. But unfortunately, human beings, especially those who aren't classically trained, as most people are in any field, like say if you want to work with a psychologist, you're not going to have the same training. So you're going to go by more base human level assessors of value. Mm -hmm. And one of the main ones is communication that like you mentioned, how well someone communicates, how charismatic they are. Mm -hmm. So I feel like what you said about psychologists trying to, psychologists taking more of accepting that responsibility, having ownership over that, like trying to improve their communication. I feel that that goes in all kinds of fields where people have this same concern about, oh, this person is just a communicator, you know, yeah. this person is just good at talking, good at, good. but they're going to take the lion's share of the audience, aren't they? So uh, unless you've got something further to add to that, I can uh, move on to the next. Yeah. Yeah. And there's just, just two or three points. Yeah, sure. There's a, there's a very famous book called how to win friends and influence people written by Dale Carnegie. I think it's the most bought book in the English language. I think I'm not sure on that. And he writes in a very famous, famously that humans are emotional beings, not logical ones. That's a very, very potent phrase. Humans are emotional beings, not logical ones or something to that effect. And this is, mm. this is demonstrated in this notion where humans would generally follow people who are good at speaking and without getting too political, there was a reason why Trump got elected in the States. It's not a logical decision. It's an emotional decision. 
mass emotion. Because <laughs> logically speaking, <laughs> brother shouldn't have been in that position. You know, <laughs> this is an emotional world. But that's, that's proof of that. So you've got to accept that, that actually, okay, humans work this way. And what we know about spirituality, what we know about it, even the Dean or being psychologically trained, it's about touching us a slightly higher level of consciousness where we are actually more logical, where we are actually more pragmatic. When you look at the Quran and you look for evidence, you're not just honoring, oh, I do this because it takes me to feel good. No, you're looking for the evidences. And this is a wonderful kind of segue as well, because Islam promotes that. Islam promotes logical thinking yeah. and empirical, ba empirical yeah. based thinking. So yeah, humans, yeah. we've got to be, we've got to be more that way inclined as well. So psychologists need to take that on board and to understand that, listen, we've got to be better than everybody else that communicates. If someone who's not classically trained is really the communicator, we have to be better at communicating than that guy. And until they take that ownership, nothing will change. <laughs> we'll continue yeah. on this way. Yeah. But in the Islamic field specifically, there's a, a responsibility on those kind of charismatic speakers, let's say, to also funnel the audience towards proper scholars or classically trained scholars exactly. and kind of inculcate that mindset of trying to train the audience to be more discerning, just like how it's become a cultural norm, like you mentioned, to go to medical doctors for medical issues, right? Yeah. It's just a cultural norm, isn't it? Whereas say with nutrition advice, it's not become a cultural norm. So people can listen to some guy who's promoting the carnivore diet and try that. And then the next, they can listen to someone who's a vegan. There's not that, there's not that kind of cultural element of, oh, I've got a nutrition question. Let me go and see a professional nutritionist. And lastly, on the communication issue, because I was thinking about it recently. And one of the reasons I was thinking about it was because of the rise of this personality called Andrew Tate. And the, why that was interesting, <laughs> why that was interesting is because essentially Andrew Tate, you have to say that he is a charismatic individual in terms of he has an ability to speak fast. He incorporates humor and then he also uses the strategy of creating like a scene and using controversy and all the rest of it. And a lot of Muslims have become somewhat negatively impacted by what he says. But the point is, unfortunately, I would say most people can't replicate that as in now I've already started seeing the trends among certain online marketers where they're like Muslim selling Muslim investment courses or something. And they'll start off about, oh, do you know about the, those of the Ashram of Bashara, like the, the, those of the 10 companions that were millionaires relatively. Right. And it's all nice and Islamic terms and all the rest of it. And then towards the bottom, they used to, if you don't want to stay a bomb, then you need to take action and trying to incorporate that controversy element as well. And I was like thinking like people are going to try it, but unfortunately not everyone's going to be able to execute on that level. Not saying that he has praiseworthy points, but he has praiseworthy kind of charismatic elements that they won't be able to replicate. Um, sure. but yeah, anyway, before going too much into <laughs> and all the rest, let's get this. <laughs> I love you laugh, mashallah, as well. This it's like, a, <laughs> it's like a, it's like a Malaysian laugh. Oh, really? You get that from Malaysia because I, I think, I, yeah, no, I know. I think when I landed in the airport, I think they were handing them out in packets. So I took a few, I took a few Malaysian laughs and I kept them. <laughs> That's good. You should definitely keep it. Okay. So the next question that I wanted to move towards was, hmm, I'm thinking how to kind of phrase this in terms of how would you, I want you to talk about the two elements of like mindset strategies. Cause I know you touched on it where you said, obviously one of the three elements of what you do as a performance psychologist is working on anxiety, depression, and kind of inner issues. Let's call that like tackling the, or building the inner citadel. Right. And, but then you've got the results oriented thing about ensuring higher level of performance and ensuring greater consistency. So uh, I want you to talk about like the divide between the two, because sometimes people are very tactic orientated. Mm -hmm. Like I need to do this, that I know there's always going to be a link to the mental side with everything because essentially neurology is involved, but let's say someone who's very like tactic focused, spend 10 minutes in the sauna, then I'm going to have a cold shower, then I'm going to do this. And then someone else, 
how do you do that divide between just focusing on the mindset and inner elements and external kind of pre-performance routines and things like that? So I just want to make sure I've got this question down. It's a, it's a question between how do we decide what the focus area is? Is it people's performances and their routines? Or is it the outcome-based thing, which is the results and the trophies and the medals? How do we discern? Is that correct? Not necessarily in between performance and outcome in terms of results, but just, I guess it's one in the same. I was more talking about how, say you have different strategies that you can use like pre-performance routines and things like sure. getting yourself into the right state and certain things that you actually do. Like I mentioned, say someone might have a routine where they have to do some breathing exercise to get in the right kind of mental space to take mm. action, things like that versus just purely psychological interventions. I don't know, like just focusing on limiting beliefs or tackling limiting beliefs, things like okay. that. Okay. Okay. W wonderful. Wonderful question. So it's got, it's, your, your question is, is interesting because it's got a few directions and then it's got, it's got some depth to it as well. There's like a shallow answer and then there's, there's a deep answer. So when a, when a client comes to you and says, I'm having problems with my confidence, that can mean anything. That can literally mean anything. And as a psychologist, who you won't know what that means until you talk to them and you try and help them articulate. One thing that I always remind everybody is that humans, we have a great problem articulating what we experience, because even if we do know what we experience, we still can't come out easily. And secondly, we might not know what we're experiencing. So we have even more problems articulating. So the psychology is there. If you imagine that big ball of thread, right? It's all the mumble jumbles and psychology is there. It's just trying to ease it out bit by bit, make it clearer, just drag it out, drag it out, drag it out until we know what we're working with. Once you know what you're working with, you can then decide what direction to take. Is this an issue where maybe my routines before I need to train or perform are not on par? Or is it an issue where I'm doing everything properly and I still can't perform? Then you can decide, okay, for example, if you want to take a shallow approach, which still might work perfectly, get those routines down perfectly. If your routines are consistent, guess what? Your performances are going to be consistent too. If on Monday you're doing routine one, Tuesday you're doing routine two, and Wednesday you're doing routine three, <laughs> your routine, your, your routine is going to impact your performance and your performance will be all over the place. But if on every single day you're doing the same routine, your performances are probably be, going to be consistent. Now, if an athlete has got all those routines down, they've got the breathing techniques, they've got the pre-performance routine, they've got the stretching and everything else, but they still can't perform, then it's a case of, okay, we need to go deeper now. Maybe perhaps you've got some limiting beliefs about yourself. Maybe this is a case of your routines aren't quite enough to overcome this inner battle that you have, because any athlete will tell you the number one opponent is themselves, right? So then that's a case of, yeah, okay, let's talk again. Let's pull it out again. What's going on? And again, athletes or anybody might have difficulty articulating that. So as a psychologist, kind of need to help them along with that. Get it out. Let's find out what we're dealing with. And then you might use psychotherapeutic models to kind of change those limiting beliefs that they might have. So for example, athletes who are, are very anxious, anxiety is telling you that you're already afraid of the future. That, that's there in the name of anxiety is I'm afraid of the future. What if, what if, what if? That could be, you know, might be able to settle the symptoms of anxiety with a solid routine or with some breathing techniques, but the root and the source of the anxiety won't be cured with that. You've got to talk that through and you've got to have some psychotherapy or some psychotherapeutic coaching to deal with that. Only then can an individual surpass that kind of anxiety and really get rid of it. Does that make sense? Yeah, Mash. Yeah, definitely. That was exactly what I was asking, Mashallah. So I appreciate you trying to like get the question right before answering. Yeah, that's exactly what I was talking about in terms of the delineation between the practical tools, but then the deeper mindset issues and the link between the two. Yeah. Okay, great. So who is your ideal person to work with in terms of what qualities, actually, I wouldn't say ideal person. What qualities do you see in someone like sports person or anyone else for that matter, where you think, you know what, this person has potential in terms of being able to perform at the highest level, whether that's within a certain context or not, in terms of what general qualities do you, do you think a person needs to have to be able to be a high performer? This is a great question. I, I've kind of been asked this question a number of times before, and I, I've thought 
very, very hard around the kind of answers that we love. But if I was to stream it down, because there's a hundred odd things here, if I was to stream it down, I would say coachability is a big one. Is how coachable is this individual? Can they listen? Can they articulate what their strengths are and what their weaknesses are? Are they interested in changing? Are they diligent? Are they accountable? Are they open to receiving feedback? The most successful individuals are all coachable because you can be the most talented and gifted athlete, but if you can't work with anybody, or if you can't take instructions or you can't talk to a coach or well, good luck doing everything on your own, it, it won't happen. So coachable athletes are the ones that tend to go far. The second thing that I kind of look for is, is specifically that's more on the personality and the characteristic side. Specifically in the performance situation, those athletes who are able to enjoy or produce some goods at the bigger events or the tighter moments in their performance situation, the tighter moments in games, they are the ones that normally tend to excel because they kind of see the pressure situation as more of a challenge rather than a scary situation where they need to be timid or they shrink. They kind of make themselves bigger in those situations. And that's what really separates them. So when you look at the kind of the gold medal winners, yes, for sure, they might have fear in those gold medal situations, but they normally tend to get bigger in those situations. A different level will come out in those situations. They might even lose in smaller competitions. That's fine. It's just the individual, but on the bigger stage, they tend to get bigger. So those are the kind of two things that I would look for. One is the coachability. And the second would be the ability during the tighter moments or the bigger moments to really expand themselves. In terms of me as a psychologist working with individuals, I, I will not look for these things. I'm only commenting here as someone who kind of knows sport. As a psychologist, I would look to work with anyone who wants to improve their mental side of the game or, or their lives, whether they be young, old, or whatever, I would take them on. I, I, I wouldn't be a case of just saying, oh, you're not top performer, leave you be. I, I, would, I would never do that. I would, it's just like, you don't meet my criteria and good luck, you know, like, I'll stop from you. I would never do that, you know, like, come on, let's chop. And they yeah. would kind of agree the goal, see where they want to go. And I would always try to help them to realize the strengths that they have, but maybe they don't know that they have. That, that, that's, I'm a big believer in that. Everybody has a lot of strengths and not aware of. I would try to help them to highlight those and help them improve on the mental side of the game, no matter what level of competition that they're in. Mm, I love your answers, man. I love the way you articulate the points as well, because the thing is going for an interview like this, you're stabbing in the dark a little bit because obviously mm -hmm. You don't really have that much video content on your Instagram. So after this, I definitely recommend that you get into that because I think you have a talent for it or like you're good at it. And I'm going to make this into smaller clips as well that obviously I can send to you as well if you want to share them. But yeah, just I have a couple of points on what you said and then move on to the next question. So on the coaching element, it was like, you know, someone in, as in someone who's into self-development, you realize it's one of the core kind of tenets of self-development essentially like having a growth mindset you know made famous from carol dweck's book mindset right having a growth mindset always like seeing a problem and essentially seeing it as an opportunity to grow into that not having a limited mindset and i know there's studies behind it i'm not going to get into that but it's, say if there's a problem like i'm building a podcast right and i want to improve the the podcast and then i was just looking at solutions get this software do this editing grow it by doing these clips like it's a challenge to be tackled mm. versus having a limited mindset would be like no i can't do it i can't talk to people and there's so many bigger you know what i'm trying to say and i've always thought as someone with that mindset i think it's quite shocking for me but you have to have empathy in terms of like understanding other people and everyone's different different experiences when i came across people like in the professional sphere that they don't have a growth mindset mm. and it's you just feel a bit sad for them essentially because it's like there's limits on them and they, they don't really know how to tackle it it's like normally people with a growth mindset when they get feedback they kind of take it on because their goal is to improve and it's like more of an egoless kind of taking it on it, it depends how you get it obviously in terms of but then i remember i've come across certain people as i'm sure you have that they literally can't take feedback mm -hmm. as in and it's a deeper issue because i've seen it where someone will just say something slight like this spreadsheet you just you should just do it like this like in a nice way and you so, you see like a switch in how they they suddenly take it as a shock and it's like excuses and i didn't do this and 
they, I was like, it's quite shocking to see. And yeah, yeah I just wanted to make that observation on that. And then on the point about how you like to see athletes that can perform on the bigger stage, I think everyone shares that to an extent, like, you know, sports fans in general, there's a quote by Mike Tyson that's quite famous where he says he was always scared, but it's like he was able to act. He was able to take action and perform despite the mm. fear. And I think naturally we respect people that are able to perform at the highest level because you can somewhat get a sense of like the anxiety and like the emotions that that would cause say if someone's about to take the final shot like the final penalty or Tyson Fury fighting Deontay Wilder and it's like the big puncher this guy's just come off three years we then when he is successful we automatically have more respect for that right. individual don't you think and I feel like that comes from like a natural inclination everyone that, that, that's exactly right Adil and Adil if, if you don't mind I am good, I'm definitely going to address that point I would like to just rewind slightly to, to the the, the excerpt spreadsheet feedback moment you gave about feedback that's okay but may I just say yeah sure wonderful. thank you yes there's we we had this issue in psychology and also just in in the community settings where we were trying to help people get better this this was way before I was even born this was 60s 70s where Say people with severe challenges, depression, anxiety, addictions, whatever it was, alcoholism, were going to community centers or to addiction centers to get help because they're, they're really having problems, right? And when they went in there, all of the psychologists told them there's something wrong with you, get your life together, come on, what you're doing, don't you think about your kids, look at all of the stats, if you keep drinking, you're going to get like this and if you keep smoking, people who are addicted, they know this stuff. They know this stuff, you know, even on the cigarette packs, smoking does this, they know that, but they still open it and they still take the cigarette out. Why does this happen? Because people trying to convince others doesn't really work. Convincing other people doesn't really work. And if you look at the last hundred bits of advice that you gave someone, you could count on one hand, how many times it actually did what you said and did it instantly and did it the way that you said it. Advice doesn't really work. What works is, is understanding that person from an empathetic standpoint, standing at their side rather than pushing them or dragging them and actually saying, look, what do you want to do? Where do you want to go? And then when they're ready for the advice, they'll say, Adil, can you give me some advice? At that moment, they're ready for advice, give the advice. Then, then they're ready for the feedback, you know, and for that person with the, with the spreadsheet, you know, from the emotional mind, because we're emotional creatures, right? Probably just thinking, oh, what are you trying to tell me that I'm not good enough? That's the emotion response. No matter how well it was packaged, the emotional mind has kicked in there. So as humans, we need to be more empathetic. We need to be more understanding of other people's situations, kind of open them up and get them ready for advice, then give advice rather than giving the advice because the doors are closed. The ears are shut. Let's open up people's ears first and then have a good conversation and treat them like humans. And that, that's what we learned from, uh, from other kind of clinical areas of psychology where they are actually able to have good results with people who have severe addictions or smoking problems or anxiety problems, actually just listening to them and understanding the world from their perspective, then they're more ready for change. Your last point just now, wonderful about, about sports and how well we respect them for sure. You know, you know, the posters and the highlight reels, and we love that. And it's, it's interesting because when, obviously I, I like that as well. Of course we would look at these, wow, how did they do that? It was amazing. You watch the video over and over again. We think I want to do this as well. I kind of think back. Previously, before sports was even a thing, and you look at, say, at the time of Sahaba, someone like Khalid bin Walid, who was a top performer. <laughs> he, was, he was a top performer, man. You know, he, he's, got some, he's got some good success rate in battles. And I think there's an element of that. Like, when, when we see people performing on the really big stage, we know that we can rely on them and we can depend on them. And maybe in that, in you know, you mentioned boxing. I, know that, that I used to box as well. I learned that I would recommend that people box, brain injury, like that, you know. I love boxing. We just recommend a similar. I used to as well. Let's keep it. I was, I was going to say as a joke, we just recommend body boxing. <laughs> but, but punch the body, that's it. Exactly. You avoid that and avoid your head getting hit. But there's an element of that, yeah. that, there's an element of that physical that we really respect. You know, maybe people who might be able to help us in society, maybe move difficult challenges within the society, you know, or to help us with physical challenges. Maybe someone where if we were caught in a battle situation, who could step up and perform when our lives are on the line? That there, there is some crossover between sports and that kind of military safety component. 
And even if you look back at the way the Olympics was founded, which I'm not, if I'm not mistaken, was from a Greek town called Olympia, I think. Things like the discus and the javelin and the hammer throws, these are all ancient Greek weapons. And I think that's how the contest of sport really began. You know, when they were competing about who could throw the javelin the furthest, you know, and who could throw the hammer the furthest, those, those were all battle weapons. So there is definitely some kind of cross element between sports, battle and warfare, and that we kind of look towards sports style because maybe those are the ones that we would assume uh, could step up in a, in a pressure situation. On another note, not, not to get too political again, but the war in Ukraine, we saw it with there when there were athletes who were stepping up and they were going into their militaries. And I think that a lot of people thought, wow, you know, this is amazing. They're, they're, they're hard people within their sporting domain and they're also doing it in real life as well. So they, I think a lot of the respect that we have for athletes kind of comes from that potentially. Yeah. And I feel as a man or as men and shepherds of our flocks, right? Yeah. And everyone has some form of a responsibility to do that within the small setting that they're in, within their realm of responsibilities and qualities to try and work on these aspects of marua and like manliness from like the Islamic version of that, not any kind of uh, modern incorrect notion. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, man, some of the points that you made, yeah, definitely they resonate and especially I feel like just one last point on that is, especially with giving da'wah and, you know, nahiya wa munkar and forbidding the wrong and enjoining the good, it's especially important to have that element of empathy. But also I feel like there's certain cultural things that you can do as in, I was going to make a separate video on this and it was like, essentially you can make it culturally more normal for the for people to expect advice and take advice less involvement of the ego and emotions mm -hmm. right and i feel like there's certain cultural norms like in the west you've got this thing about no judgment and don't judge me and these kind of m mindset mentalities that seep through obviously there's some deeper issues and deeper psychology that can affect it on an individual level mm -hmm. but i'm talking culturally i feel like there are certain things that you can do because essentially the example I give is say if you're in the office and someone brings in some snacks or treats or something, right? Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of Muslims there and you see a Muslim who, whether or not they're visibly practicing or not, they go for the snack or treat and they're about to eat it. And then some other Muslim will come and say, don't eat that, that's haram. Now, what you'll find is within that setting, the person who was about to eat the, let's say, haram ingredient or debatable ingredient they generally won't have a negative reaction no. they generally they'll be like oh yeah. thank you for telling me even if they're not visibly practicing even if they don't wear hijab whatever right because and some people they take it positively because it's you've assumed that this person will care about it enough right. to take it on uh, so it's like a positive thing but then i was thinking replace the food replace the haram ingredient and change it to anything else and they won't, there's a less of that assumption that this person wants good for me and he's advising me. So let's say if someone was using bad language or something or any other kind of publicly haram act and that same person was to say, don't do that, that's haram in the same way, right? In the same kind of visceral way, don't do that, that's haram. I'm correcting you in public because you did it in public. You can imagine culturally the reaction mm -hmm. is night and day different and that's the point that i was trying to make that this this is a cultural thing and we can similarly aim to shift the culture in a positive way where muslims have this mentality where it's like adopting the growth mindset if someone's telling me advice they're bettering me they're helping me it's not like they're telling me something i can't change if you've not got an arm and someone's constantly saying you haven't got an arm you haven't got an arm you can't do anything about it they're telling you something in the deen even if you've sinned you can get forgiven straight away there's nothing really negative in in the actual sense but yeah what are your thoughts on there's, that there's a beautiful point there's a there's a wonderful point and because as you're saying that i can just imagine that and i think i've been in hundreds of those situations as a bystander watching this kind of thing you know it could be a case of you know some sweets and they check the ingredients could be, it could be anything, you know, like that, you know, being in the, in the corporate setting as well. There's, there's an element of connecting to the most supreme value that an individual has. And from, from the Muslims that I've met and that I've known, I think all Muslims have a special place in their heart, the deen, without a doubt, whether they practice or they, or they don't, the deen is serious and it's not, it's not a joke. 
So when the advice is related to that, it helps a lot, particularly with halal and haram food. I, I believe that most Muslims are very, very strict on food. I think it's, it's more likely uh, the, the probably the most unlikely haram that people would do would probably be to eat pork, I believe from, from my own observations. So particularly where food is concerned, for sure. In other cultural aspects or in other practicing aspects, again, to be called out or to be told, don't do this, don't do that. You know, the individual needs to come face to face with their own limiting beliefs. They need to come face to face with their own challenges that actually, do you know what? It's important for me to not only be strict with my food, but also to be strict with my salah, to be strict with my language, to be strict with the way that I dress and to spread that goodness that you have towards your food with your drink and your language and everything else, because it's all halal and haram. So that when someone else does advise me, they're meeting the box of my deen rather than, oh, it's about my food. So once the individual embraces that and they spread that positivity from their food towards everything else, they would be more willing to, to hear that advice. And again, sometimes it's a two, it's a two part thing. There's the advisor and then there's one in receiving the advice. The one receiving the advice, all of us, we have to be open-minded. We have to listen more to others. We have to be more humble and just think, oh, how dare you say that to me, brother? Who the hell are you? Hello. I'm not going to take this. We need to drop this. And the ones where we're giving advice, maybe we need to think about how we're doing it. Are we, are we chastising people in public? That's not pretty nice, is it? Let's build a relationship with that person and then pull them to the side and say, brother, look, I noticed that you did something. Is there something behind that? Was there any reason? Talk to people in a courteous way. They will understand. And this emotional barrier that they have, it will melt away. <laughs> so that, that's why, like, when, when we talk to people, the, way, the words that we use are very important. And I would like to finish on the last point. There's something that I reflect on a lot, that Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam became a Nabi at the age of 40. 40 years old, <laughs> yeah. And he, in those 40 years, he had built up so much trust and respect through his character. The way he dealt with people, how he spoke, how he did business, how he carried himself, how he treated others, contributed a lot so that when he was a Nabi, he was someone with standing that people would listen to. And I, I, I think there's a lot of that we can take from that. There's a lot that we can take from that. Actually, we got to think about how do we hold ourselves as people? Every interaction is a way to connect to someone or go further away from them. Every interaction. So are we winning these interactions? Are we coming close to people or are we going further away? When it comes time to give advice, they will trust us. We put some credibility there. Inshallah, we'll be able to spread some good and also receive some good as well. Mashallah, beautiful point. Yeah. Okay. Getting back into performance psychology and here's another, I like like stuff that I've recently read or come across or just from the various readings over the years, I like kind of combining that into different sure. insights and questions. So I, I, I was to try and add flavor to the question. Right. So here's one that I was thinking about. Because me personally, naturally, or conscientious personality, so I'm all about routines and rules and stuff like that, right? And I've previously made a video about how one can argue that Islamic practice is easier for someone with a conscientious personality, but that doesn't detract from the rulings in terms of it's not all because you struggle with it. As in the rulings are the same. Everyone has to pray five times a day. Everyone has to do rules are the same. But anyway, the point that I was making was where do you feel like in terms of pre-performance routines, where do you think it crosses over into too much? Where it's another psychological issue of someone, it becomes a crux in terms of if they've not done something, then it starts negatively impacting their perceived level of performance, like what they can do because they've missed out something. And the, I'll add something else to that point before I let you answer it. And that's, there's this famous businessman, he's kind of marketer, he's currently gone big on social media, Alex Homo. I love his videos. I love his insights. And he's, he's, he's again, another example of the best communicators rising. He's got, he's got like a perfect mix of depth, but also charisma and like everything else. Right. And the point that he made that he's known for a little bit is like, when people ask him, how do you start? What's your morning routine? Morning routine is, is like one of the key topics that people love in self-development. I'm guessing if I made a video that was just morning routines about different people, they'd get so many views. Morning routine of Daniel Heyhadju and that kind of stuff, right? But anyway, people are expecting him to list off a long list of things that he does, right? Like I go in the cold plunge and then I do 10 minutes of sunlight viewing and all the rest of it. And he basically goes, he doesn't believe in it. He goes, he has a cup of coffee and works. And he's the point I'm trying to get across is you need to do the work. 
and he's he's like saying like the less time you spend working it's less output so he has a very kind of binary approach and then there's other people who their morning routine takes two hours right mm -hmm. what are your insights on that because I, I like how you tackle questions on <laughs> i like how you put them across so th th this is kind of a two-part question the second part obviously being about where's the kind of the sweet spot on routines and the first part of the question was kind of like when does it become too much and how do i know if i've done enough so for that first part of the question is anything that you do if it leads to a bad outcome or leads to you being blocked in a certain way it's probably not good and if you, anything that you do helps you achieve what you want and unblocks everything else, then it's good. So if you have a five minute routine and it's helped you perform, then it's decent. If you've had a five minute routine of something else or a 10 minute routine of something else, and then you've not been able to perform, get rid of it. So every individual is so different. It's more along the lines of, did it help me get to where I want to get to? That's how you know whether it's good or not. Where people get stuck as well with routines, things like OCD, where it becomes a compulsion, an obsessive compulsion to do a certain thing, otherwise something bad will happen, which is slightly more on the, on the clinical side, you will see that individuals, they might actually hate the fact that they do that. And also it's impeding their lives. It's stopping them from functioning normally. It's stopping them from, you know, being around others because they might notice their OCDs. So there's, there's the obstacle right there. So you know that whatever that routine is, it's helping achieve what you want. And individuals as well, they've got to play around with this. They've got to know what feels right. They've got to remember back when I performed really well, what did I actually do? When I performed really bad, what did I actually do before? And then they'll have a kind of a, a more of a binary approach. They like and said, there's a, there's a positive side to the routines and the kind of the negative side to the routines. Yep. They've got to figure it out for themselves. And they just got to try and experiment and reflect. The second part to that question was just regarding Mr. Alex Holozzi, <laughs> where he's talking about. Okay. I just wake up and I just have coffee and I just get to work. Every individual has a totally kind of different structure for how they want to go around in their mornings. And it's up to, again, for that individual to find out. For me personally, I would say if you're waking up early and determined and you're doing whatever makes you feel comfortable to start work, then do that. If that takes five minutes, half an hour or two hours, that's up to you. Because an, indiv an individual, let's say, for example, they don't have family commitments. That will be totally different to someone who has family commitments. So they still need to get their own personal things out of the way in the beginning of the day. And that is also work as well. That's why I, I like to say to our mothers and our sisters who might not have jobs, they are working hard <laughs> with the, with the kids. <laughs> so their morning routine might be different. Do you get what I'm saying? So the individual needs to take into account their own personal circumstances. So I did, did I answer that question? Or do you feel I was a bit missing that? Yeah. No, no, definitely. I was thinking like, because I've experienced and because I'm into this kind of stuff and read a lot of the books and all the rest of it, I've experimented with so many of these things that they talk about. Obviously I don't have access to a cold plunge in the back garden or like <laughs> a home sauna or anything, but <laughs> I'm sure if I did, I'd probably add that in as well. And what I realize is like through self-discovery and oftentimes the things that have the biggest effect you can narrow it down to that, the very simple things. Like obviously caffeine is one of the biggest ones, right? Certain other supplements and nootropics and stuff. But I feel like a good way to find in the middle is like doing something, trying to get your 90 minutes of your most important task done. Like a, do a work block, whether it's 90 minutes, 30 minutes on your most important task, and then go back to your morning routine, if you like, in terms of, because what I was, what he was getting at Hormozy was that some people to have that optimal routine, they like do 10 minutes meditation, 10 minutes visualization, stretching and different, and then sunlight viewing, and then all these things. And he was trying to say that because it adds up to so long, it takes away from your prime energy to kind of take action. And it's hard to see the link between that because you've added so many things. So I like your point about how you have to monitor it and keep track of what's leading to the results. Because right. if you do everything in one go and then you suddenly experience the benefits of, let's say if you double your dosage of caffeine, right? <laughs> let's say if you're having 100 grams of uh, milligrams of caffeine and then you decide to do 200 milligrams, but you also add in meditation and you also add in a visualization, right? And then suddenly the next week you're like, 
in the morning you you've got more energy and stuff and you ascribe it to the full routine when really it was probably just like the additional caffeine so you have to get, yeah. i would say add one thing in at a time so you're able to keep track of the results isn't it yeah yeah for, for sure for sure and again the, the point that you made is a brilliant point about being able to mix and match and play around and understanding actually what is the thing that i'm doing that's having the effect and alex on what was his point there and like you like correctly referenced like okay maybe this might be a bit too much, but Alex Homozi can't speak to someone who's doing all of that and it's going well. There might be someone who's doing a lot and they're achieving whatever they need to achieve. Not everybody wants to run a multi-million dollar industry or a company the way Alex yeah. Homozi does. So everybody's performance is, is different. Everybody's goals are different. At the end of the day, Alex Homozi is doing something that gets him comfortable. He's taking coffee. Outcome is I'm comfortable to work. Another individual is taking 90 minutes. Where are they getting to? comfortable to work they get into the same spot yeah and at the end of the day humans are so so individual we're so so different we, we can't say that one way is more superior to the other unless obviously we've been told in the quran and sunnah as muslims we, we can't really say that I, I always give the example of this let's imagine that you and everyone in your family were given a house on a road a blank house let's say for argument's sake it's painted white everything is white in this house and you have the house for a year. You, your sister, your brother, your mother, your father, grandparents, everybody. Think in a year about how different those houses are going to look. The different colors on the walls, the different ornaments that you've got, what you use the rooms for, how you've organized certain rooms, the gardening side, or the front porch side. They're going to be so different because you are entirely different. And human beings, we are like that. We need to embrace that individuality, take what's good from others. But if it doesn't implement with our routines, with our genotypes as well, because our genes have an impact on this, with what we like to do, with what's comfortable for us at that specific moment in our life, because we change all of the time as well, then it's not going to work. We've got to embrace what's good for us and leave what's not good for us. So there's definitely some trial and error there. But I did, I want to add on a different point to you, to, something to make you think, rather than just about the morning routines, because the mornings are super important, without a doubt. Mornings are so important. We know that from Panjur Salah and Tahajjud, how important mornings are. <laughs> Without yeah, that. and obviously there's the hadith as well about a benefit in the morning, the morning period and stuff. Right. So yeah, carry on with your point. Right. How about having routines which are through the day rather than one just in the morning? Your, your mindset going into a block of work in the morning is important. But what about before lunch? What about just after lunch? What about around out of time? You see that we just work all in the morning and it's done and we're good for the day? Or do we need to do things throughout the day to keep us going? And believe it or not, once we kind of track it down, we will be able to identify that actually we could probably have routines through the day as well. If we're going in the office and out and back in the office, okay, what are we doing for the second trip back in? You know? And what are the things we're doing whilst we're in the office that interrupts our flow? What about the phone? The phone goes off, 20 minutes we're distracted. Oh my goodness, what's happened to my work? And then we're blaming the morning routine. No, my friend, it was the phone. <laughs> so we've got to create a good environment. <laughs> There's my laugh again. We're going to create a good environment for our workspace, whatever that may be, our performance domain. Think about our routines throughout the day as well, not just everything uh, solely on the morning routine. Because for an individual who might not land the routine in the morning, they might get downhearted and think, oh, bloody hell, my whole day is gone now. Oh, now the, the rest of the day is still there. And you've got a good an amount of hours to still achieve something. Keep hope you can achieve something and keep going. Yeah, definitely. I was speaking to someone yesterday as part of a project where they said the exact same thing. If they miss 10 minutes, then they feel like they've not succeeded in that day. And just on that point, definitely, I just wanted to add because as a reminder as well, that obviously as Muslims, your main priority is attaining the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So like your morning routine should definitely look different to like the non-Muslim guru who's running a business, isn't it? Like you should have, or you might have azkar and like tahajjud and fajr and things like that and you might think they're not necessarily muslims should know this that obviously they're not necessarily worldly productive but you're trying to be productive for your akhirah which is the overarching objective for muslims and one last point was that recently on the point of routines throughout the day and also about how small things can have a massive effect i recently started using nsdrs like non-sleep deep rest protocols that andrew huberman popularized and I would say in terms of the effect on performance and mental clarity and energy, 
to give you that boost, let's say in the afternoon, about eight hours after you wake up, where you normally move into the phase where you've got less mental energy. Alhamdulillah, it's so powerful. And that's something like, obviously we have the Gailula, like the, the nap, the tradition of the nap is essentially a better version of that. So it was already within the tradition, but people, I don't think people realize the power of these kinds of things. And it's a good segue actually, because now I wanted to ask you, and if you've got any additional points, you can combine it with this answer, inshallah. How does your coaching differ? Would you say most of your, one, are most of the people you work with Muslims? And two, how do you differ your coaching for Muslims or like practicing Muslims? Oh, wonderful question. Wonderful, wonderful question. Yeah, so I, 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 will, come, I will come to that just, just on the last point that the, the more we understand yeah. our deen, because there is so much to learn, we will normally find all of the gems that we are looking for there. They, they are there. They are very close to home. They are very, very close to home. And what good is a gold medal or what good is a multi-million dollar business if the accurate is compromised? So everything that we do in terms of productivity, yeah, okay, I spoke to 10 clients. Okay, but did I get 10 rewards today? That's, that's the real meaning of productivity there is how well are we securing the akhirah? That's the, uh, maybe, maybe that's how it holds the reins as Muslims. It's how well are we living our lives truthfully as Muslims? and still being productive at work to achieve that. To answer your point regarding, to answer your question, sorry, regarding coaching about how many Muslims do I coach? Is that correct? And how do I coach? Yeah, would you, would you say they form the majority of your, the people that you work with and how has that kind of changed the way you work? Okay. So when I, when I first came to Malaysia, I would say it was a good half split, 50%, but as time goes on, it, it just, it goes up and down. I, I couldn't, have, I couldn't say this is the amount that I'm working with. I would say that there is a, a good sizable number there that are, that are Muslims because surely the number of people here that are Muslims is quite high. And a lot of my connections here are Muslim as well. So that's normally how work would be attributed. It's like kind of, you know, that this is a trusted individual, let's do some programs, etc., And that's how you meet people as well. When I started to work with Muslims. I was still kind of applying general psychology knowledge to Muslims and it was active, but like we mentioned right at the beginning of the podcast, or kind of in the first 20 minutes or so was about our ability to connect with the client. Your Muslim knowledge is very, very advantageous in that interaction. It's not client and psychologist, it's Muslim client, Muslim psychologist, and you can use that to your advantage. So say, for example, if you're using cognitive behavior therapy which might be attributed to the ancient Greeks and Stoic philosophers, which are a lot of the philosophy is, it's no different really from a lot of what's already in Islam. So you can still apply those same principles in an Islamic model and sharing Quran ayahs or hadith or stories of the Sahaba or understanding how that individual connects to Islam, how they connect to their performances from a Muslim perspective. It's a wonderful way to adapt coaching services because it'll help you do more work that is more beneficial to the individual. If the Muslim, if the coachee is already Muslim and you are a Muslim, you can talk to them on a different wavelength than they're non-Muslim. Naturally, you've got to use that to your advantage. And the field of psychology in general is quickly learning that, that actually we need to embrace the culture of the individuals that we speak to. And also we need to understand the context that we work with. So right now at the moment in the UK, the National Health Service is having a big dilemma that there are not enough black, Asian, or minority ethnic groups as psychologists. We have been saying this for a long time. Why is it so hard for us to get position? Now they're coming around and saying it, saying, we have a big problem. And we're like, yeah, you have a big problem because a massive population of the UK are black, Asian, and minority ethnic groups. So if you're, if you're a South Asian man, or you've got like me, East African heritage, South Asian, whatever it is, and you go to see a white psychologist, there's gonna be a level of barrier there. Then if I was to see a South Asian, East African psychologist, I'm going to click with that guy more. So it's the same with, with the Islamic kind of coaching as well. So add on, as I progress in my career of psychology, I'm becoming more and more attracted to Islamic psychology. It's, it's, it's a lot further along the way than what I practice at the moment, but it is very, very attractive. And it's something I discuss with brother Martin all the time. Is about how can we make the jump to become Islamic psychologists? How can we use the deen and how can we use psychotherapeutic models and bind them in a way that's found with Quran and Sunnah to help Muslims, better Muslims and be better performers and be better people. How do we do that? And 
there is some good amount of knowledge there. It's still a, a new field, but it's something I'm very, very excited to come into. And I, I do foresee, inshallah, that I will be leaving this, this field of sport and form psychology at some point, and I will be making the move to Islamic psychology, inshallah. I, can, I can't wait for that. I don't know how long it's going to take because I want to do it in the right way, but it's something that is very, very attractive for me. So I hope that inshallah, 100% of my clients are Muslims and 100% of my work is adapted to Muslims. I hope, I hope so. I hope so. Okay. Just in terms of time, do you need to, yes. have you got more than five minutes or? Do you, I'm do you good to carry on. I'm, I'm, I'm good to carry on. Honestly. Okay. I'm good. I made two, I end two hours free. I'm good. Okay. <laughs> okay. Mashallah. So, the, cause then obviously I don't have to be as concise, okay. I guess, with my yes. questions and points. Okay, but I had a, some beautiful points that you mentioned in that. Firstly, just a quick one was, I'm sure you're aware, like there's Abdullah Rothman and he works at KM, CMC now, Cambridge Muslim College, I think. He has like a book on it. And also the, there's another book that I've, got, that I've got on my Kindle about, essentially that's what kind of rejuvenated the field in a sense. What I heard from one of the lectures that all star Abdullah Rothman gave. Okay, so that's that. And the other thing I'd written down is, yeah, I think one of the one of the impulses for me to start this project back when I started it was I got into self development heavily, and then over the years, for about ten years, or I'd say about five, when I was about nineteen, right, and but I didn't really start reading and listening to audiobooks until a few years later, mm. and then when that happened i realized how many of the core self-development tools are already within islam and that's what kind of motivated me to start this project in a sense because you find a lot of the tools are already within islam and even better so it's like even the little things like affirmations right we have <coughs> excuse me we have azkar right which is essentially if you understand the meaning it's like the ultimate affirmation if you just say it with, without thinking like, oh, I need to do my subhanAllah or bihamdihi a hundred times and you're just doing it mindlessly, then obviously you still get the deed of saying it and the reward of uh, saying the words. But if you were to internalize it and you're like saying Alhamdulillah with the meaning and trying to visualize something that you're grateful for, you've got the tools within Islam. And th this is what I always like try and put across through the project, even like with Alhamdulillah, it's like encompasses gratitude which is like such a big area and now there's more studies behind why it's such like a beneficial right. thing. And then you've also got like a visualization. I shared a, a video on this because I found it in Sheikh Hamza Yusuf's book on pur purification of the heart. He mentions visualization in one of the, one of the lessons about having high hopes and he mentions how sports people visualize and he mentions stories of certain like pious predecessors who actually used to lie down in coffins, right? And he mentions how they used to have this practice of lying down in coffins to visualize death and the Akhirah. And that, see, that's what I mean when I say like the confluence between self-development and like the common self-development ideas and how they can, and they've always existed. But Muslims, we need to rediscover that history and that beautiful practice. And then also you've got things like obviously the blessings of the morning, basically any self-development tool out there essentially. And then stoicism, you mentioned another like favorite topic of mine. As I was reading those books, I even emailed Ryan Holiday once and he replied and he was like, I look into it. And then in his next book, instead of talking about Islam, he mentioned something about Sufism, which I hate when they do that because these people in the West, when they do want to give credit to Islam in some way, they try and stay safe or like they try and stay woke by only mentioning Sufism when essentially it's Islam, isn't it? So like in his stillness is the key book. He has a bit on Sufi practices. That was interesting because we've got the famous hadith that if you were to give someone one hadith about self-development, it'd be that one or in terms of like stoicism or having a, a good mindset, which is the one about all the affairs of the believer are good because if something ostensibly good happens, it's good and it's khair. If something bad happens, he's patient and he gets rewarded for it. So it's like a win-win situation, right? Mm -hmm. And that's like the advanced level of stoicism because in stoicism, unfortunately, how it's taught now is without the dimension of God, without the dimension of the next life. So they have to apply it, but limit it to this world. So how they'd use it is 
okay, if something good happens, it's good. If something bad happens, it's good because you've learned something, right? That's how they phrase it. Or you've, you've gone through some kind of pain. Alhamdulillah, we as Muslims, we have the additional benefit of the akhirah, as in something bad's happened, you go through the pain, but guess what? You're getting rewarded for it in this world, like you're building the deeds and it's going to help you in the akhirah. And then there's like quotes by, I came across some like Ibn Taymiyyah and other scholars, Ibn Josie is another favorite um, because he has a book where, I forgot what it's called, but he has a book where it's more of his reflections and it's a rare insight that you don't normally get from scholars of the past because most of it's tailored towards putting out a message or like teaching something whereas this was his own kind of cognition and his own thoughts and it's really revealing. And Ibn Taymiyyah, he has a quote where he, he goes through the various options of what his enemies can do to him. And he's, they can put me in jail, which is good because I'll have time to pray more and engage in solitary ibadah and get the benefits of solitude. Then he's, they can exile me and that's good because it's tourism, <laughs> something like this. And it's like that same mentality that when I was reading, I was just like, mashallah. Okay. And yeah, and I want to take it back to you. If you've got any, anything to add to what I've yeah, just said. All, all wonderful points, you, you know, and again. Once we learn more about the deen, I mentioned that you mentioned there's some big imams who contributed a lot to the field of psychology, whether mainstream psychology knows it or not. I'm currently writing a paper which is to address that and I will send it over inshallah. I'm actually due to send it by Tuesday, <laughs> believe it or not. No, no, Wednesday, Wednesday. I'm due to send it by Wednesday, talking about the influence, you know, that Islamic imams and early psychology practitioners had on the field of psychology because a lot of cognitive behavior therapy and stoicism can be attributed back to major Islamic figures, but also it's all there in Quran and Sunnah. It's all there. You know, in the in Quran, when it says like something along the lines of, sorry if I'm misquoting the ayah, but it's, you know, Allah will not place more upon a believer's shoulders than he can bear, something along those lines. Yeah. That's, that's a wonderful way for a believer to accept the trial that they're facing because if they believe in the Quran, the Quran has told you that Allah is not going to give you more than you can handle, so you can handle it. You can handle it. That is, a, you know, that's, if we're talking in psychology terms, in rational emotive behavior therapy, we call that high frustration tolerance. I can handle it. I can tolerate it. I'm going through it. Well, it's in the Quran there. Allah's told you you can handle it because, because it's guaranteed you that, you know? So a lot of the answers are already there in the, in the Quran. So, you know, we just need to look and pay more attention. When you mentioned about the, like doing tasbih and azkar and stuff like that. And people talk about mindfulness now. Well, well what's that? That's paying mindful attention. That's having a clear niyat at the present moment of what we're doing mindfully. Obviously, without the Buddhist and Hindu narratives, we have an Islamic alternative. And this is what this is the kind of thing that I think that when we kind of get more involved in it, it will just increase our faith and our iman because the answers are already there. We just need to look and embody them and practice them. What I believe will happen until in the future, inshallah, is that. Scientific studies will bring people more closer to religion than ever before. Things like, you know, you look at EEG scans of the brain. What happens to people when they're expressing gratitude? Which parts of the brain are waking up? What's the mental health benefits? What's the, what's the, the reductions in depression and stress and anxiety and other mental health illnesses through gratitude and being kind? People will start to look at, okay, we've been taught to be kind and we've been taught to be grateful. From what? From religion. We will go. The society will go full circle. These are not new things that they can, and psychology has a wonderful habit of repackaging all things and say, look new. It's not, it's all there. It's already there. We just need to look more. So I hope that for Muslims watching this, when they look for psychology help, they will look more towards Islamic resources. I hope that because there is a lot there, even in the English language, you know, there's books by Malik Badri as well. I think his name is Ambar Haq, who is a famous yeah. There's so much out there and they know what they are talking about. They are very, very well versed. These are, these are guys who have studied literally everything there is to study and have brilliant minds and they can articulate it and put it out there for us to read and understand with the authentic terms as well for the Quran and Sunnah. I'm not going through all of them, but from what I've seen, there is plenty out there, you know, Islamically ing integrated psychotherapy. There's much more coming out. So I'm very excited in the next five to 10 years what's going to come out and people like, you know, Ryan Holiday who are repackaging stoicism and unfortunately he's, he's mentioned Sufism without Islam. We will get our credit when it's due. 
you know, when, when it's time, it will all come back our way, inshallah. So I, I do believe that. And all we've got to do is look more towards the Islamic resources. We have more people in the Islamic community embodying psychological principles, spreading it out in a good way through either coaching or online platforms or, or what you're doing, mashallah. Fantastic. You know, you've set up a, you set up a highly psychology driven website and a platform. And you know, people are going to watch this one, two, three, ten, a hundred people are going to be inspired by this. They're going to go back to the authentic resources. They're going to go back to Islamic resources and they're going to embody more psychology from that than from anywhere else, because it is a superior form. And we need to believe that, that what we have is superior and it works. Mm -hmm. And what? <laughs> 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 Mashallah. And uh, yes, I feel one positive is that at the way the world's going and what you mentioned as well about things going full circle like they oftentimes do, the positive is that because of Islam, even those Muslims who aren't or haven't been practicing but they've been raised in the West, one thing that I've seen is the more say if a non-muslim who doesn't have this what's the word they don't have this heritage right they don't have a religious heritage because they're too far removed from like their christian past right when they get into trying to get back in touch with spirituality and filling that void of having fulfillment and not just material success they can go to all kinds of weird and wacky ideas right depending on whatever they grab onto, what gives them meaning. They might dedicate their whole life to what we as Muslims would see as relatively futile, uh, relative to like the big questions and all the rest of it. But Alhamdulillah, Muslims, even if they're not practicing, they will tend to move back towards Islam because it's somewhere within, they're closer to their fitrah in that sense. And it's somewhere within their memory, whether they went to the masjid as a child, and they can reconnect with that and I feel like that's a beautiful thing and definitely a positive out of it and you mentioned as well I think that I is and yeah man I forgot about that I'll add that to that's definitely what was the phrase that you used uh, what is that high so, high tolerance yeah so it, so, so I'm, I'm trained in rational emotive behavior therapy and also cognitive behavior therapy and I, I'm that I dabble into acceptance commitment just to help individuals understand their own psychology and give strategy right because that's my job in in the REBT in, in lingo it's called high frustration tolerance high frustration tolerance it probably could be called high tolerance of frustration it could be that. because it means that I can handle a lot I've endured a lot I'm still surviving whatever I've been through I'm still here I'm still fighting I'm still ready through the day I can handle a lot. And this is a wonderful way for us that, you know, we could body in an Islamic context as well, is that I should think that, you know what, I've been through a lot. What I'm facing right now isn't that much of a deal. You know, it's sometimes we get so caught up in what we're dealing with that we actually forget, you know, what's the bigger picture here? What's happening in the afterlife? I'm going to be dying soon. Like you mentioned that there were some, there were Muslims who were placing themselves in coffins. What Albert Ellis and what other stoicism, uh, stoicists will call, stoics will call uh, memento mori, which is think about death. You know, it's the same technique. It's the same thing. Thinking about the bigger picture, you know, if, if someone disrespects me and I'm like, oh, how dare you, you horrible person, et cetera, et cetera. Brother, is it the end of the world? Did you die? <laughs> Did you get sick? No, it's gone. Let it go. It's happened. And then you flip it in another way. Say, have you ever been rude to people before? Well, yes, I have. Okay. Then why can't you accept other people being rude to you as a human being? And again, these messages are still there in the Quran and Sunnah in a more superior form. So, you know, the visualization you mentioned earlier, I want to make this point. Reading the Quran, you sit and read for a few minutes. You will see how visual it is. Any description of Jannah and Jahannam is visual. <laughs> it's, it's giving you the psychological training as you read it. It's giving you visualization practice as you read it. We, we have in our minds clear images of what Jannah might be like and what Jahannam might be like. We're told to look around the earth to, to kind of bask in all of the beauty that Allah's made because we are visual creatures and we embody that and that in helps, that helps us improve our psychological skills. So again, every, everything is, everything is already there. And just to reference your kind of earlier points as well, we, we, we need to have more Muslims spreading this, you know, it's all well and good that, yeah, for example, a Muslim in the West, they will reconnect to their previous, their youth or their childhood or towards closer to their fits or fine. Non-Muslims coming into Islam, they will only know about it when Muslims are spreading it. Do you get what I'm saying? We have to have these kind of messages that we are sharing to the world, which are top quality, 
connecting with people in a fantastic way, communicating with beautiful words. And inshallah, we'll be able to connect to more people. So it's a, it's a duty as well on, on Muslims to kind of spread this and really connect more to the deen. And that's advice to myself more than anyone else. <laughs> I, I'm going to do this more. Okay. I'm going to do this more. Final couple of questions, inshallah. So one one is for the audience because i have to ask you this because well i don't have to but but <laughs> this last month I, this last month i had a, a video that has got loads of views in malaysia right and yeah. it's got it's got me something like 400 subscribers all from malaysia which i feel a bit bad about i was mentioning to you before because i feel like they clicked because of that one video, which was about Malaysia, then the rest of the stuff, they might still be in self-development. So just for those lovely Malaysian people, right? I clip it as another sub clip. Tell me your experiences about living in Malaysia, like the positives and how you find it. And as someone who's made Hijra or moved to Malaysia, just talk about that for a bit. Okay. So first things first is when I kind of. I never really knew of Malaysia till I was like 11 or 12, but once I had come across it through the badminton scene, I was so happy that badminton players were Muslim. And I was seeing that their names were Muhammad this and Muhammad that. I was fascinated. I was like, oh, wow. So I started to look more into the country and I, I always had that kind of inclination that Malaysia is a special place. Funnily enough, in my house, there was one Nasheed CD album where I thought they were Chinese brothers because I was only eight or nine when my mother bought the album. But they were Malaysians too. And that was the Rayhan album, you know, and I actually learned those songs that were in Malay. <laughs> purely from listening to them so much, there was the sheet, purely from listening to them so much, but I actually thought it was Chinese. So I had a kind of, a, a kind of an affinity for Malaysia already. <laughs> I was still ignorant at that time. I'm China. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I said, there are Muslims in China too. Obviously they're not there. I think there's more Muslims in China than in Malaysia. But I, I had that kind of affinity for Malaysia. And I think just, just when it came to the idea of being able to come to Malaysia, to be able to work, to have a network, it just kind of happened naturally. And I think once I had that kind of goal and affinity, everything kind of fell into place. From being here, Alhamdulillah, I never have to worry about anything. If I go out, I know within five minutes, I can come across the cleanest, most beautiful, well-designed, peaceful masjid that you can think of, just around the corner. Wherever I am, I, I, I'm, ne I'm never struggling to look for places to pray. And being from England, where when you go to Tesco or you go to Asda and you're constantly checking the packets or all of the ingredients, what's in there, can I have it, can I not? I can't explain how liberating it is when you live in a Muslim country. Well, they might not say they're a Muslim country, you know, where Muslim is the official religion, where Islam is the official religion and there are Muslims everywhere. There are masjids everywhere. There's halal food everywhere. I can't explain how liberating that is, man. You feel totally at comfort because maybe there's a part of you, which is calling out for home that you can only find in a place where there are lots of Muslims being here, especially there is such a strong push for development here. I kind of imagine that Malaysia is now like the way that the Emirates was in the 90s, where it was rapidly, I see that I see Malaysia on a very, very curve of growth. It's going places and it's going as fast so people want to come here. Lots of people want to holiday here as they should. It is an amazing place. And there's a good mix of everything. There's a good mix of cultural, uh, you know, mashallah, the lot of the Malaysians that you can speak multiple languages, uh, the Muslim communities, versed in Islam, they're all Islam dear to their heart. So it's just wonderful to be, it's just wonderful to be in. And I can't speak highly enough of the country. You know, I might not be here forever. I, I can say that openly. I might not be here forever. People who are wanting to make hijra. Or they're wanting to think of moving to a country. I would go for a holiday, try it out, see the people. Think about work opportunities if you can get it. Think about any other opportunities to come and spend more time. And, you know, it's a good place to be. It's a developing country. There's lots to do. People mean, and Muslim is very easy to live here. And I, again, I can't explain how liberated are them. I think your audio is slightly cutting off. So it's the last question anyway. Okay. No worries. Just some personal advice. Just some personal advice because I've always been interested well not always i've had <laughs> i've had some interest in psychology and like i mentioned at the start i was looking into developing my academic studies into it because i've exhausted the pop psychology word let's say right you could mention uh, any of these famous books i read it or i've read them and what advice would you give me if 
in terms of if I want to get into psychology and develop into it as a potential career, I just want to hear it from, obviously the understanding that I have is get a degree, master's conversion, whatever, and then see whatever area you want to go into after that. But I just want to hear it from a f professional in terms of as a Muslim as well, what advice you'd give me. Okay. So, so Adil, what kind of, what kind of psychology do you, you want to get into? Do you know yet? Obviously I have the thing as a Muslim being in self-development is that Islamic psychology, right? But more than that is I need to get the basic qualification first and then CBT as well in terms of, because you can give generic advice like we spoke about before, but I'd also want to have an underpinning in like some form of like proper academics as well. So I would say I would want to train to become a therapist as well. Therapy. So yeah. Okay. Wonderful. Wonderful. So I did what, what I would say you need to do is, is to firstly think about where you want to be because your training and qualifications will have to match where you want to be. So in England, you've got to think of getting crazy with the British psychological policy. There's no real way around that. There are other societies around as well. The British Association of Behavioral and Cognitive Psychotherapies as well. All of the guys who are credited there have some level of BPS accreditation already. So do this, do the conversion. That's an MSc, if I'm not mistaken. Maybe change university. Let me help. You have the university. After that, look for, look for child. So there would be another qualification on top called the stage two qualification, or you could go into a position assistant psychologist in getting real hands-on clinical experience by other clinical psychologists as well. You go for the doctorate in clinical psychology, which is a very, very popular route for a lot of people to have a PhD at the end, also to have a lot of psychological training. After that, you could specialize in Islamic psychology. Based in England, then you can specialize in Islamic psychology, uh, in inclusion boards, because they'll have more Muslim, more Muslims on them. They will tell you how to practice psychology with the Muslim population, how to do it Islamically read up there, there are some courses available. I think that are being run from Bradford, if I'm not mistaken, there's one at the university of Oxford as well. Oh, and the, at the one at Cambridge that you mentioned, they are coming up slowly lectures here and there, anything which will allow us to, to better work with Muslims in an Islamically compliant way, because we don't want to be straying outside of that. Right. That's the, what we've got to learn. So that will combine cognitive behavior therapies or any other third wave therapies. So CBT is what we call a second wave therapy, right? There's also a body of third wave therapies as well, like acceptance commitment therapy, dialectical behavior therapy. These might have more literature coming out in the future about how they could be made Islamic, right? Learn about these. And then once you're qualified, you're registered, you're fully accredited, you've got all of your badges, then you could start your own practice and work with individuals, inshallah. So that would be the way. If you're, if you're moving outside of London to the UK, like elsewhere, See what the qualifications that you need are in those countries to be compliant with the government there and build them up. And then inshallah, you can open up your own practice. So, so that would be the advice. Thank you for that. And then what do you think of uh, positive Islamic psychology? Have you heard of that? I, I haven't I mean, heard of yes. No, no, tell me I mean, about this. Okay. Well, I, I don't really know that much, but I know that the founder is Malaysian, right? And I think the center's in Malaysia as well. I only came across it because I know brother Gabriel Romani, who's a previous guest and he's, I consider him to be like a teacher. He's done, he offers positive Islamic psychology code. So I was just wondering, but the thing is, obviously it's not like a formal accredited course kind of thing. It's, it's more like you go on their website yeah. and then you have to go through the relevant. I, I have, I have come across that. I, I, I have, I am aware of own brother. Own. I'm, yet okay. to, I'm yet to meet him. So, inshallah, one day I hope you, I, I do follow. No, where is he now? <laughs> Has he told you? He's, <laughs> he's left now though. He's left Malaysia now. Oh, okay. Okay. Well, I've missed my chance. All right. Well, maybe, maybe I'll find him in Turkey, inshallah. Yeah, yeah. I, I think he's in Turkey. Allah, Allah has written it. That will remain, inshallah. I don't know yet. For, for positive psychology in general, <laughs> we, we need to understand that psychology has kind of two different ends. Yeah. Yeah. So the, the negative end of psychology is I have a problem. Please fix me. I'm struggling with anxiety. Fix my problem. That's the negative end. Okay. It's, it's avoidance of an issue. It's a get me out of a, get me out of situation. Positive psychology is about flourishing and going to your hundred. So when negative psychology is about avoiding your zero, positive psychology is about going towards a hundred. 
being the best that you can be, growing as you can. So I would imagine that positive Islamic psychology is about looking at the Quran and Sunnah from a psychological perspective, embodying that in as many parts of your life as you can to the best of your ability. So that's what I would imagine that would be. And I think that's a wonderful way of, of looking at psychology. And I would assume that psychological coaching in that way would look to overcome mental health challenges, problems with following the deal, any kind of relational issues and kind of marriage issues and family issues from this positive psychology perspective to think about, okay, mentally, how are you approaching this perspective? Emotionally, how are you approaching this? Sorry, the situation. How are you approaching it? How are you dealing with it? How are you flourishing in it? Is it to the best of your ability? So I, it sounds to me the right way to go. Okay. Jazakallah khairan. I know I've taken like 20 minutes more than we initially stated, but Alhamdulillah, I think this was one of the best conversations that I've had on, on the podcast. One of my favorites, at least, uh, enjoyed it and also learned a lot. Like I said, I like the way you explain things and how you answered the questions as well. So I'm sure everyone listening would have also enjoyed it and benefited yeah. as well, inshallah. I just wanted to ask if there's, other than your Instagram page that I link in. Yeah, I, I, just after said, I, I, I think I'm blushing. <laughs> too kind, my <laughs> <development. to direct laughs> Too kind, just too kind. I'm trying my best, trying my best. But my, my Instagram oh, page is MD Performance Psychology. And my, also my website is www.mdperformancepsychology.com. People can just message me on Instagram or they can message through on the, on the website for questions. If they want to learn, if they want to get in contact for, for coaching, if they know anyone that want to get, or wants to get in contact, wherever it is, they want to bump heads and connect, please feel free. I'm open and I think that I'm pretty friendly, inshallah. So <laughs> anyone can message and I will get back to them, inshallah. Thank you. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Okay, jazakallah khairan. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim.